uh, Miss Tay and uh, Man In, uh, you can help me add the, the students. Uh, I made yes, the photos. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, okay. While waiting for everyone to get into the Zoom room, I would like to remind you of our usual house rules. Okay. Uh, keep yourself muted. Okay. Uh, you may un yourself during the Q&A session. Uh, the Q&A session will start uh, right after the, pres the end of the presentation of our guest speaker. You may also use the chat box uh, to type in the question, or you may use the raise your hand icon if you want to ask your question personally. Okay. Uh, today, we are, today, we are very fortunate to have our fifth distinguished speaker for the ADP lecture series. Uh, to start off today's session, okay, uh, I just want to give you again a, a background uh, of, I mean, for our guests uh, uh, who also are now uh, who's joining us for today. The ADP lecture series is a platform uh, basically to expose students to real world learning by engaging them to distinguish guest speakers, their expertise uh, through their, their design works, practices, philosophy, research interests, and advocacies. The lecture topics are aligned uh, to the themes and focus of the studio. Likewise, aid and inspire students in the development of their final design project. Okay, I would like everyone to give a warm welcome to our uh, distinguished guest speaker, architect Rasim Mahmoud. Uh, before I pass the screen to him, I would like to give a short introduction about our guest speaker for today. Okay, our guest speaker architect, Razin Mahmoud, okay, uh, is the founding director of Razin Architects uh, on architecture practice operating from Johor Bahru, Malaysia. Upon graduation from Louisiana State University uh, in USA, architect Razin was attached to Ace Matt Architects in Austin, Texas before returning to Malaysia in 1989. After gaining experience with few local firms, Architect Resin established his own practice in 1996. Resin Architect's portfolio includes diverse projects uh, and clients in the residential, commercial, community, and educational sectors. Some of these projects have been acknowledged both locally and internationally. And they include the award-winning projects such as the Baan Tatara, Denai House, and Surau Nusa Idaman. Outside of his practice, Architect Rasin is actively involved in architectural education and is an ex external examiner for several universities in Malaysia. In 2019, Architect Rasin was appointed as the adjunct professor for the Faculty of Architecture and Survey, University of Technology, Malaysia. Some of his uh, international recognition includes the Art Asia Gold Sustainable Award in 2014, 100 Architects of the Year from Korean Institute of Architects in 2013, and the SEDA uh, Awards Indian Design Magazine uh, Indian Design Magazine, Golden Mal also the Golden Malaysian Emerging uh, Architect in 2014. Okay, so, and just quoting him uh, from one of his interviews or uh, in, in a publication, uh, architecture is more than a shelter. It's about providing a way of life. Okay, so without further ado, I would like to introduce our Distinguished guest speaker for today, Architect Razim. Architect Razim. Thank you, Prince. Thank you. The organizer of uh, this uh, talk series is an honor to be here, actually, uh, to be invited by Taylor's University uh, to share experience on the, what we do and the kind of project that we do. Uh, I'm going to start uh, sharing the screen. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, uh, kind of uh, embarrassed actually, because those uh, titles or awards that you talk about actually happened 
uh, a few years back. It was started in 2011 and 2014. Uh, we didn't win much award after that, except for 2016. But luckily, luckily for this talk, I can just announce that I just got a silver award for my mosque for Pam Building Awards uh, last two weeks. So, uh, Alhamdulillah, and th thank you. Congratulations, Al okay. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, title of today's talk is The Anatomy of a Small Project. I'll be sharing with you, all the students, on uh, what happened uh, or what we do when we embark on a project, whether it's small or big. I think the process is more or less the same. So we're going to start with uh, knowing the keyword today, getting to understand what anatomy is all about. Yeah. If you Google anatomy, the thing that you will first see is this, the study of human parts. This is anatomy of human body. Anatomy is not study of human body. And another meaning for anatomy is, in fact, the a study of a structure or internal workings of something. So you can study, you can have a detailed anatomy of society and institutions. And uh, for this particular talk, it's an anatomy or is a, a cut up, a dissect of a design process. So I'll be sharing with you on the strategies and of or objectives that we set when we embark on a particular project. How do we start? How do we get things done? Okay, in universities, you will start with a project brief, and uh, what you do, try to understand the brief and make sure that you comply to the requirement that is set by the school. But when you go out, uh, if you're lucky, you get a project brief. Uh, otherwise, you are to study or to come up with a brief yourself because the owner will come up with just something simple. I want a bungalow, I want an office. And as architect, for some reason here in Malaysia, the architect himself has to try and understand what the client wants. Uh, a little bit of uh, description on what we do. We are in the service industry. We serve somebody, we serve someone, we serve a group of people, we serve the government. I mean, if we do things for ourselves, then we are not giving service, we're just doing something that we like. But when you go out and practice, you are actually servicing somebody, someone, or some institute, whether it's the government or a club or a group of uh, hobbies or something like that. So they are called the client. So there's a lot of other uh, profession that is in the service industry, but the product or the service that they do may be different. Hotel and catering, they're also in the service industry. Uh, medical professional, they're also doing service. So their solution or their offer to you is different. They offer medication, they offer food, they offer clean room for you to sleep in. But as architects, we offer a physical product. We turn their needs into a physical building solution. We didn't just talk about it. We actually prove it that it can be done, that it can be built within the amount that is set, within the uh, amount that is agreed upon. So we are selling hopes, but at the same time, we have to make sure that it is, it will appear physically. So it's a lot more tougher than uh, psychiatrists, for instance, they just listen to you and they talk and then they charge you. They don't offer anything that's physical other than the tablets or medication that they can uh, prescribe to you. But we 
in the end must offer a product that is physical, most likely for them to live in or for them to work in. Okay? But the big issue is that we are problem solvers. We, we don't start with designing the doors and windows immediately. We must first try to understand the problem. Oh, let me try uh, give you a comparison between a doctor and client, an architect and a client, doctor and a patient, architect and client. You go see a doctor, you'll be asked to sit down and doctor will ask you, uh, what's the problem? And you answer, I have a headache and stomach ache. Okay, uh, any other problem? Oh, that was it, uh, just headache and stomach ache. A doctor will give you aspirin or Panadol for your headache and maybe charcoal pill for your stomach ache. And then you go to another doctor, uh, he might be, give you the same uh, uh, medication for the problem that you just mentioned to him. Yeah. So most likely you will get the same kind of answer or solution to the same kind of problem that you told them. And it's common, it is accepted worldwide. You don't tell a doctor what to give you, you just listen and accept. But for an architect and a client, it's different. They come to you, you ask them, what do you need? Oh, I need a house. I have six cars. I want the cars to be in the basement. I want six rooms. I want uh, eight toilets, big kitchen and all that. That becomes the problem. And as architect, you provide the answer. You will give them a house, three stories high, probably with a basement that can fit six cars and you comply to every requirement. But one thing that's different, you are expected, you are expected to give a different solution. You are expected to be creative and you cannot be doing the same thing like other architects are giving or the kind of building that other architects have built. You are expected to give a different solution every time, every new client that you have, you are expected to give something different. So the keyword here is, what's the problem? The same question is asked by the doctor and by the architect. What's the problem? When you ask the question, you get to understand the needs of the patient or the client and then you get to provide the answer. So design is problem seeking, problem solving. So to be good in design, you must know what to ask, not only how to provide the answer, because when you ask or when you dig in deeper and ask for a different set of questions, then you might find some specific needs of the client. So I go back to doctor and patient relationship. You ask the same set of questions. You probably give the same set of prescription, but the moment you ask for something different, oh, you got a headache and stomach ache. You will ask about what time the uh, sickness started. You ask about does anything trigger that sickness? You ask about what you eat before you were sick. And suddenly the prescription that is common may be different because you are now uh, doing specific or uh, custom design the prescription or the medication for the patient. Same thing with architects. We shouldn't just simply ask the same set of questions, but we must try to understand the needs of the client and ask a different question so that we can provide a different solution. So design is not just about providing a suitable answer, but also about asking the right question. That's 
fundamental issue is to tailor made to custom made your set of solutions to a specific set of questions. In other words, make the project brief as specific as possible so that you can provide specific solution to those problems. Good design starts with full understanding of the problem. In every project, it's about determining the problems and finding answers to it because in every problem lies opportunity. When you find that, hey, you're not supposed to just do a building, you can do something else. That's a golden opportunity for you to create something different. Okay. Take a look at one simple example. IKEA table. Everybody knows table will normally have four legs and a flat surface on top. But why do I choose IKEA? Because their set of problems or their need is different. They want it to be good looking and they want it to be cheap and affordable to everyone. So they will start with rep hiring reputable designers. You see, some of the tables uh, in IKEA actually carry the name of designer because they are proud to inform the world that these are good designers that have been selected to design IKEA products. Of course, they will choose different material to suit a different quality. But three things that they will apply on all of their tables is self-assembly, self-pickup, and flat pack because that's probably the only way for them to make the product affordable. Where as the buyers, as the users, you buy and assemble the products yourself. So you save tons of money there. They save storage space and all that. So it's easier for them to ship the product all across the world. So I'm going into straight into the project that we did uh, way back in 2010, the one that was mentioned by Prince just now, which is a small surau uh, in 2010 in surau uh, in Nusai Damai. They wanted it to be cheap and a low budget because they don't have money. They actually don't have money then. But at the same time, they want it to be comfortable and they want to erect it very fast. So again, they start with a reputable designer. That's me. Thank you very much. And then uh, I decided to just give them a basic structure, basic material with available knowledge in how to get it built. Uh, it's bare finishes, uh, cement render, and uh, you build only what you need and you go natural as possible, meaning that you, we don't have the money to even install a proper air conditioning system in the building. So what I gave them was a shed a bangsal in Malay, a tall structure with big umbrella roof that is suitable for our weather. Uh, it's all done in steel because we wanted it very fast, but we were afraid that uh, we just have the prayer pavilion uh, open with uh, no walls. Then we get uh, animals coming in, cats and dogs, and disturb the worshippers during their prayer. So we built this perimeter wall. It's a form of fencing actually to uh, get animals away from the praying area. And we put in uh, holes in the wall uh, to allow for air to pass through the space. It was very fast. It was completed within three months time, just like what the client and user wanted. So there it is big umbrella roof, uh, the cheapest material available in the market, normal uh, hollow section steel with a three meter overhang all around. So all I had was a, a raised platform for the praying area. A photo of the surau when it was completed, this was in 2010. And then uh, we used whatever uh, concrete, uh, 
that is given to us uh, to the maximum. Uh, it was a bit over than the quantity that we asked for. We use the same concrete for our uh, precast uh, paving blocks or precast concrete slabs. This is inside of the praying area, an open to sky uh, courtyard that help to maximize uh, or encourage uninterrupted airflow for natural ventilation of the space. And because we were there before any other residents, there was no electricity, there was no water pipe uh, near the building. So we had to install solar panels. It was very expensive then. Uh, we had to install solar panels and LED lights to provide light for the building. Uh, we even use uh, uh, leftover, uh, what do you call this, culverts as our wash basin. And this is how it looks like after a few months, after it was completed, it was visited by a few universities. Uh, we didn't expect to gain uh, glory from this, from such a simple back to basic building. Uh, but apparently it was like a model for uh, green and uh, natural uh, eco-friendly building, I suppose. Uh, I was really not into green movement at that time. Everything was so expensive, but we managed to find uh, people to donate uh, for the installation of LED lights. Uh, the Koya really worked as uh, an element to promote uh, natural ventilation. And in 2011, we won the highest award uh, from PAM. Uh, under a special building, we won gold award. And after that, the same building, uh, the same drawings and photograph were exhibited in Korea. And that was when I was given the title 100 Architects of the Year. Uh, and we won under sustainable category. Like I said, I did not submit anything under sustainable. It was, it was uh, done uh, as basic as possible because there was no budget to do a proper building. But somehow or other, this is accepted as a building for its purpose and for the community. And somehow they have accepted this as a, a sustainable example uh, on how to build public buildings. We, even, we were given gold by Acacia uh, as a sustainable building. Okay, that was in 2010. And then 2017, the same committee asked us to design a mosque for them because the surau, the small prayer hall is not, is not uh, big enough to cater for uh, residents because it was the newly uh, created uh, township. So people started moving in, more and more people coming into the neighborhood. So instead of just 200 people, they wanted a mosque for 2,500 people. But besides, uh, this time around, they, they have a bit more money. Uh, they have a few million dollars, a few million ringgit. And they wanted to somewhat maintain the appearance of the surah that we did a few years back. But they want to show a symbol of progress. So my job was to translate what progress is or what progress was to, to, to the community. Because it's not only progress from something small to something bigger, but it's a progress of the religion as well to show that Islam is progressive, Islam is relevant, Islam is not stuck with the ornamentation that was done 800 years ago. You know, we wanted to show something that is more relevant to the climate and to its time. So we started with this instead of a raised platform like the one you saw in the surah. We started with a small air conditioned prayer hall. Although they wanted it to be for 2,500 people, that was for during Friday. But on normal days, they have only about 100 
200 people max. So I designed a place for everyday use that is air conditioned. I wanted to reduce the energy that's needed for the air conditioning system. But we have plenty of overspill space so that you could cater for the additional uh, number of worshippers that come on Friday or for during uh, annual festival like Hari Raya or Idol Fitri. So we make sure we have plenty of overspill space, whether inside, underneath the roof, or outside the building. So we created this tropical plaza where you can pray underneath the trees. So in short, you can uh, not only house 2,500 people, but you could actually have more, probably 3,000 to 4,000 people at any one time. But some of them will be praying in the open plaza. Detailed plans of the mosque with the air conditioned uh, prayer hall. And that was the original appearance, that was the original look that was used to uh, gather donations from corporates. Uh, we wanted to use just, uh, what do you call this? Uh, expanded metal as our screen, but we realized that it's not actually working to filter the light. There's still a lot of lights coming in. So there's a view of the inside. Uh, we want, because it's a lot of, there's a lot of glass there, we plant trees uh, along the corridor outside the prayer hall so that uh, it can provide shades inside the praying area. So the shade that we finally use is a solid galvanized uh, metal. Uh, it won't rust and it's much cheaper than aluminum. And as I say, we plant trees to provide shades to the prayer hall that you see on the left. And this is the look from outside, a glass box with perforated shades. Uh, at least 50% is uh, solid. I think more than 50% is solid actually. And I got to confess, I was so afraid that they might not know this as a moss. So I actually put a title there. This is a moss. We put the name of the building there, Masjid Daing Abdul Rahman. It was completed in 2019. Uh, it went viral actually in Johor. A lot of people uh, come to see the, the building. Uh, it was uh, published in Singapore Magazine and uh, local magazine. Suddenly it become the uh, photo of a mosque whenever the government or whenever the media talk about uh, social distancing in mosques. Uh, there was a lot of pictures inside the mosque that uh, has uh, appeared in the newspapers. It's a simple box, people. It's just a glass box with screen around it. And as you can see, there's still the old surau that is kept, uh, which is turned into a multi-purpose hall now. Oops. That's the plaza that I told you about, the tropical plaza. We planted uh, big trees. Uh, but I understand it will take time for these three to really grow and meet each other to, to create a shape for the praying area. And uh, early this month, like I said, uh, we were given silver under public and institutional uh, category. They call the mosque as a game changer, which is uh, a nice thing to hear, actually. Uh, I was just doing my part or wanting to show something different. Uh, the intention was to uh, create something that could be personal to the uh, congregation that could somewhat create some sense of belonging or some sense of ownership to them. Uh, this analogy that I use for phone cover, the phone is already, the handphone that you buy is already perfect. But why do people change the cover? Because they want it to be 
personal to them. Uh, it's called personalization process. If you are a football fan, you put sticker of your favorite team on the cover. If you are into fast car, you put logo of Ferrari or other fast cars on the cover. So same thing in buildings. If we make something that is different, something that is special, uh, the user will somewhat have this connection towards the building and they will continue to take care of the building and be proud of what they have. So we have a duty to actually create this sense of ownership um, or sense of belonging to the community. Okay, another project that I want to share with you, uh, the problem or the need is somewhat different besides just building a big uh, multi-purpose hall or convention center. My client wanted to educate the public. Uh, the intention was to promote uh, green building or green architecture. This is owned by Majlis Pembanaran and Kelang. They are probably one of the first uh, authority or local authority to have a certified green building. So same thing, we did something very basic, very simple, straightforward, functionally, that you have a big uh, ballroom, ballroom A, ballroom B, that can house 1,000 uh, seated guests. Uh, what we have is just one big uh, roof with skylight so that I can, I can plant trees underneath the roof. That uh, view that you see here is a view of the uh, main entrance. And then on the other side, uh, because it's facing low morning sun, uh, we wanted to provide shade again, just like the moss. But this time around, it has to be something that is special to Klang. Initially, we wanted to show uh, image of uh, or abstraction of Sungai Klang, uh, the flow of Sungai Klang, but it was too difficult to show on this big panel. So in the end, we come up with this uh, motifs that is used for the by the Raja Klang as a stamp of approval on uh, permission to use this, the river for your business or something like that. So I understand the motif now has become a standard motif for uh, Majlipan Kelang. They are using it on their souvenirs, on their tote bags and, and everything else. So which is kind of nice. So we have trees everywhere. The lobby is naturally ventilated. Uh, only the ballroom that is uh, fully air conditioned uh, everything else outside is exposed. Uh, no uh, ceiling on the outside, no icon. We use a uh, big fan for airflow in the uh, lobby area. And we have this uh, spiral staircase to be like a sculptural piece in that big uh, lobby area. And the round, the cylinder thing that you see is the lift shaft for. Uh, handicap access. As for the ceiling, I managed to convince them to use uh, timber, rough sawn timber that is normally thrown away on construction site. So we will pick up and select a good straight piece so that we can use it as our ceiling. And this is the view of the lobby with that uh, recycled timber ceiling. It's under construction right now. Uh, it is very slow actually because of COVID-19. Uh, we were stopped many times. In fact, Klang become a red zone for COVID. No one was allowed to enter the site or leave the site uh, for many months. So it's picking up very slowly and it should be completed early next year. Okay, last uh, project. I hope I don't, I don't bore you with, with all this detail, but this is actually an opportunity for you to understand the process that went behind uh, a project, actually. This is a 10-acre site uh, in Kluang. I think it's near Gunung Lamba, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, as you can see, the contour lines is so close to each other. That means it's a hilly site. There's a nice ravine. This is my initial sketch that we plan to show the client. 
This is the photo from the highest point of the site. Uh, you have hills surrounding the area. It's beautiful. Uh, the top side, uh, the top highest point. Uh, my initial sketch to the client, I wanted to have a reception building uh, and some accommodation. The client wanted to have like uh, a farm stay, like hotel rooms where you get a guest to stay and do farming together with you. It's a different uh, activity altogether, not the normal resort that you will see where you face a beach or a big lake or water body or up on the hills uh, looking at uh, Gunung Kinabalu. But this one is actually a vegetable farm. She wanted her guests to do gardening, get their hands dirty, help her with the planting of vegetables and uh, other parts of the day, they can pick up the vegetables together and after that cook it together. So that's the activity. So we started with the reception building. My initial sketch, one uh, rectangular building with a pond on one side and a patio on the other side just to enjoy the, the view. Very simple sketch. And initial uh, 3D, we showed to the client. Uh, we wanted some water to give this uh, peaceful uh, effect. The building is totally uh, ventilated. And that's the side facing the uh, terrain, facing the lower area. And then the second part is the accommodation and the hall. Uh, I didn't want to make a big, uh, a big room because I wanted the guests to actually spend their time outside the rooms. So my uh, module, my sizing was based on size of a cabin, on 10 feet by 20 feet cabin. So it shouldn't be too uh, big. At the same time, it should be comfortable at the same time. So we raised the platform or we raise the floor so that it touches the ground lightly only the foundation part will be touching the ground so we will only excavate the part where we have columns and then as as what i've mentioned to you is 10 feet by 20 feet big enough for uh, a bathroom to be in that size as well initial sketch stack the cabin and put a roof in between as they are multi-purpose area, another view of the stack cabin. And then this is how I put it on site. We showed the image of the reception building and this thing together. And uh, the client went ahead and cleared the site. It was originally uh, an oil palm plantation. So we, she cleared almost everything except for some trees near the stream, near the lake. And then we are blessed with good weather and uh, rainfalls. So the ground was covered within a short period of time. Uh, they quickly planted uh, fruit trees and vegetables. This is the site that we selected for the accommodation where we will have the, the rooms. I think eight rooms with a small, or oh, 16 rooms with a small multi-purpose hall. The view of the reception that we initially showed and the discussion that we had on site to make sure that we understand uh, their requirement. As you can see, my drawings was used during discussion because uh, we wanted to save the slope or save the green area as much as possible for our vegetable farm and not for the building. Uh, a revised view of the reception building, elongated building along the slope uh, with louvers to help uh, screen sunlight. This is a cross section of the reception building. This is what we hope to have, which is uh, a toilet that will have views to the vegetable area. A view of the 
sitting area on the upper floor of the reception building and some ID work that we propose, some cabinet. And this is the view outside of the entire reception building. Uh, we went ahead with the construction and then came COVID. So construction again has to stop and we had to proceed with our meetings online. It was actually quite difficult uh, to communicate only with uh, your computer and handphones. So nevertheless, we went ahead and allowed construction to proceed slowly. Uh, we didn't get to go to site. Most of the discussion was done online. Uh, we went ahead and built the big roof for the reception building. They had to show us videos on how the leak bricks was laid so that we get the effect that we showed on our drawings. A lot of detail, a lot of discussion uh, went through like this. We will show drawings and label it, send to them. They send it back to us with comments. Uh, in the meantime, vegetable continue to grow uh, properly. Uh, like I said, this is the main attraction now where you can stay here for three or four days and get your, hand, get your hands dirty and get involved with uh, vegetable farming and you help them harvest. And after that, you can cook the material yourself. So it's a true uh, farm to table concept. Yeah. As for the accommodation building, we, we use this kind of drawing to help the contractor to understand what we wanted to do. Uh, the location was adjusted to suit the contour. In the end, this is the final uh, renderings of the cabins, uh, only 10 feet wide, but we made it uh, a bit taller because we want to take advantage of the view. This is the, I call it the pencil unit with the multi-purpose hall in the center. Initially it was just cabin, but in the end it became more or less like a four-star resort uh, where all the rooms are air conditioned and even the halls uh, are air conditioned. They wanted to rent it out as a small event venue. It will be an event space. You can have about hundred people in, in this air conditioned structure. Uh, we purposely put Lots of trees around it. This is a study of the framing system. Uh, quite complicated because if it's concrete and brick, it's quite easy. You just draw two lines. But when you work with steel, you have to make sure that you show uh, all the detailed dimensions, make sure that the contractor understand what you want. So diagrams like this were sent back and forth to the contractor. And even the glass, the type of glass, uh, fix and top hung was discussed many, many times. Uh, this is a view of the interior. Uh, initially, we wanted to, to just put one bed, but because uh, we have limited rooms and the client wanted to get more guests to stay in this facility. So we ended up putting folding beds that can be folded on the wall and we don't have beds per se, we have a platform and the platform can also be used as storage space for their luggage. Uh, another view of the other side. This is the renderings of the multi-purpose hall. Some detailed study of the structure. It looks simple, but a lot of thoughts uh, went behind it, actually. Uh, it was built uh, using steel on the two upper floors, but the first floor was concrete because we need something solid to hold the ground. Some of the details uh, that was done on the structure. If it's concrete and brick, it's quite simple. Like I said, you just draw a line, they pour it 
they pour the concrete to make to match whatever shape that you intended to have but for steel you have to show every single size of members that you wanted to have in that building this is the view of the site beautiful view this is the casting of the slab for the accommodation hall with the reception in the background this is the multi-purpose hall in the view from inside that's the view from inside the room framing the view outside uh, view from above as what we promised we didn't want to touch too much of the uh, land area we will only disturb the construction part and not the vegetable patch that we have surrounding the site It's actually quite uh, satisfying to see that it is built in accordance to what you have done or you have prepared. View of the completed unit. It's not open to public yet, but we have asked the client to allow us to be the first group to check in. And the client has agreed. We'll be doing our uh, staff or office discussion here in this. In this uh, farm stay that's view from far and some detailed view of the brickwork of the reception building and this is the overall look of the reception area the air condition versus the naturally ventilated space view across the original rendering that we showed to the client and the actual look of the building. Uh, we don't have the landscape part yet, but we hope that it will progress well. Uh, target completion is after Chinese New Year uh, next year. So that's the end of my talk. I hope it will inspire students to believe in what they do and to really study the meaning of you know, providing solutions to the client. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Architect Rassin, for the very uh, very detailed presentation, taking us through your, through your design process. Okay, uh, I, I'm sure the students have learned a lot okay, from it. Uh, probably we can open the floor for questions. Uh, I would like probably to start with my colleagues. Any question from Ben, Jess, Manin, Taswin? Manny, Eric. <laughs> the lecturers are shy. Oh, yeah. Maybe they I were not that shy uh, a while ago. Maybe I can do Yeah, do, do. Yeah. Yes, I'll get a ball yeah. rolling first. I'll get a ball okay. rolling. Uh, thank you, uh, AR Razin. I mean, I enjoy looking at work. It's not just for the students. It's for us uh, who look at work, how controlled and disciplined it is. It's not easy because to get the right details to pare down is a lot of effort on your part. So my comment is, uh, first of all, I like your the way you analyze your building. You analyze your building, not just giving a solution, but asking the right question because asking the right question would always really help us in diagnosing the building problems, the building elements. Many of the times that we architects tend to be very egoistic and we tend to tell the solution, not come up with the solution. There's a difference, you know, that's number one, there's a statement. Uh, number two, I think your materiality is very interesting. The way you uh, you detail the building is uh, is very thoughtful and it's very uh, very disciplined. It's very it's not it's not ostentatious. It's very subtle, but there's a lot of things there. Yeah, you get a lot of things done in your work. I, I quite enjoy that. And uh, of course, uh, lastly, I would say your masjid typology is very interesting because it's very modern. I mean, I've been crying out for a long time. All of us have been crying out for a long time to see something 
as modern as your mosque, you know, your masjid, two masjid, both you showed a very, very modern topology. Uh, uh, and going forward, I think we should be looking at this sort of, uh, this sort of mosque, you know, because it's a reflection of uh, your generation, I may say so. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, just just statement, uh, Prince. Nothing much. Thank, thank you for sharing. Thanks, thanks it's to Very commendable. It's very commendable. Work. Thank you. Very Mr. nice work. I would like to share something. I would like to add a bit on the process of getting the mosque done. Uh, when I first showed it to the committee, uh, there was some really harsh question and some really hard question that was that was pointed at me. They asked me, what's so Islamic about your building? Your building is not an Islamic building. So I was taken aback actually. Then I paused and then I, I answered him uh, politely. I said, Islam is not for the building. Islam is for the people that uses the building. So it's, it's a symbol of faith, yes, but a mosque is a mosque if there are people praying in it, if a Muslim praying in it, so it will become a mosque. But if nobody praying in that mosque, so it's no longer a mosque, it's just a building. So religion is for the people. And then the, I actually showed some examples of uh, building with domes because they say dome is Islam. So you should have domes on your building. I said, no, dome started before Islam. The dome started during the Byzantine area. It was built by the Christians. In fact, the, one of the world's famous dome is the Hagia Sophia. Uh, built by the Romans, the Byzantine era. It was used as a mosque after the uh, Ottomans took over Istanbul. So in a way, what, uh, why I'm sharing this to, to you and the student is to, like I said, you have to understand the problem. They wanted a place to pray. They wanted a symbol, but you have to be prepared to answer them. If not, uh, you get shot down, you never get your uh, design accepted. So one of the hardest thing uh, during that most process was to get the client to agree. But I was uh, blessed when the head of the committee themselves are uh, learned people. He was a, a mechanical engineering lecturer at UTM. He was a professor, a retired professor. So whenever I say this kind of thing, he accepted it and helped me uh, rally and push the idea across. So it was tough, but it was uh, w well worth it, I think. Thanks, Argita, for answering. Thanks, Liu. Okay, uh, Bang, do you have any question for Argita for answering? Sorry to put you in a spot type. Like. <laughs> <laughs> then you're mute. Is it? Are you, are you muted? No. Ah, we cannot hear you. Okay, probably I'll, I'll ask a question because I, I, I'll read the commendation, I think, uh, from Keshni. Uh, it's a very good work. Nice work, uh, Architect Razin. Okay. Yeah. Um, probably I would like to ask, in which, which stage did they talk about the, the material, uh, Architect Razin? Was it early on uh, or was it that you have like few options that you were thinking for either or any of your projects? The material of the building, you're saying? The building, sir. Yeah. First, uh, we went to several phases. Uh, first of all, it has to be on, like, like for the farm stay, it's on, it has to be on the, the buildability. Uh, we don't want to create so much uh, mess on the site because we only created one access and we would like to limit the 
uh, traffic flow there. Uh, only one crane is allowed. So that's where we said that we should go for steel because uh, it's faster and it can be cut to size off-site. So when they arrive, it's, you only have to assemble it together. Uh, and then uh, for the actual finishes, uh, we try as much as possible to use whatever we have in that area that it doesn't require a long journey for delivery. I mean, you don't import uh, polished marble from China, you know, for such a small project here in, in Kluang. So we use brick. Brick is readily available. And then uh, we make sure that uh, we have the right people to, it's normal brick actually, but we mm -hmm. want to make sure that they have the right uh, skills to arrange the brick in that manner. So they will do video because we can't visit them. They can't come to our office. Uh, they will do video in their factory and then they show to us and we comment, we say 30, 90 degrees and things like that. We even arrange the brick one by one on 3D mm -hmm. model. Uh, it was fun actually, it's kind of fun. In the end that we see that you know, it's done properly. Okay, where do you draw your inspiration uh, in coming up with that beautiful form? Uh, Inspiration? Yeah. <laughs> Pinterest. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure you're just kidding. Right? <laughs> uh, no, 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 not really. Yeah, we look at <laughs> images. We look at thousands of images. Uh, sometimes you get inspired by you know some tiny little photo that you see somewhere in a magazine somewhere. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. it's from your travel. Okay. You travel to certain places, hey, this is quite nice detail. So you, it gets recorded in your brain. Uh, sometimes you don't know where it comes from, but uh, some, somehow human uh, capability is limited. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll be easier to create when you see a lot of stuff. Yeah. So my recommendation to the students is to go out, travel, read books, look at Pinterest, Google, or whatever, so that you know you absorb as much input as possible. Then you get the opportunity to select, uh, to dissect, or whatever, that you choose the one that is relevant to your project. OK? And as of my practice, uh, we try as much as possible to promote uh, sustainability. Uh, most of the buildings that I do, even for office building, I will try to, you know, maximize naturally ventilated area. areas that do not require uh, permanent air conditioning units. I will try to make it naturally ventilated. Lobbies, uh, exhibition hall. Sometimes you know, there are not that many people there. Why do we keep? Why do we have to keep it cool all the time? So open up the walls, let the go inside. Yeah. Something perfectly su suitable for the pandemic, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, Faswin, do you have any question? Yeah, Faswin has I a question. Have some oh, questions Bang, Bang, sorry, Bang. Yeah, sorry. I have two questions for you, Razin. Uh, first question is, are you a fan of Jean Nouvel? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I know him, but he doesn't know me. <laughs> uh, yes, I like his work. Uh, I was in Paris once, and the first building that I went to was his Museum of Modern Art, where he had this uh, camera. Yeah, before. the facade um, with the moving parts, moving mechanism. Because you're, you're the moss. The screen reminds me of Jean Nouvel a lot. Mm. Oh, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> so I gather you could be a fan. Uh, is a memory, like you say, a memory that sticks to your brain when you were traveling? Yeah. Okay. So is that where your inspiration was from? Or? No. 
Not really. We had, I mean, I did show you the, the whole process. We did like 10 options of the facade. Perforated aluminum, you know, complicated uh, motifs, but would be very expensive. Computer cut uh, panels. Uh, in the end, we had to come back to reality and we can only afford a few hundred thousand. We can't be spending millions on the, on the screen. So it has to be durable. Uh, so uh, we ended up with that solid galvanized. It doesn't rust because the entire material is galvanized. Uh, it's only one mm thick, I think. So it cannot be too big, so it will be wobbly. Uh, it has to be folded on the edge so that it has some strength to stand on its on its own. And everything was done on site. That, that's the beautiful thing. We only fold it outside. When it comes to site in smaller triangular pieces and we assemble together. The most difficult part then was to make it random and still mm -hmm. look uniform. We had to actually draw it one by one. We had to draw like 10... 10 types of panels. Then we have to number it A, B, C, D, E, up to 10, and then one, two, three. So in the end, we have 20 options, 20 variables. And we have to tell the contractor one A, B, C, three, four, six, seven, G, to make it random. Because they will only know what is presented in front of them. So we did some try and error. And we wanted it to be as random as possible. We don't want to see any pattern repeated on the facade. Okay. So when people ask me, what is that triangle all about? You know, why do you choose that motif? I say, it comes from nature. I say, what nature? I say, you see the, the leaves on trees? They are same shape, more or less same size but you don't see just that particular leaf on its own because the beauty of a tree is to see as a whole. They are all randomly uh, directed to in terms of direction. Mm -hmm. So my uh, inspiration is actually from nature. Interesting, thank you. Next question is, do you foresee many more mosques uh, in Malaysia uh, to be done in the same manner? I really hope so, yes. <laughs> I really hope so. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think what's, what's important is to be comfortable in that specific space. The function mm -hmm. is to worship. We'll be spending what a good half an hour to probably the maximum two hours there. Uh, you need thermal comfort. You have glass so that you can see outside, but it needs to be shaded. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm doing another one right now, a proposal for a floating moss. So I hope it gets built, but that is for another talk, I think. It will look pretty much <laughs> in the same direction? No, it's different. It's different. <laughs> this, okay. time, uh, this time, the roof is the screen. Is what? The roof is the screen. Oh, okay. Currently, I have this filter on horizontal direction mm. is to have it on okay. so it's a see-through roof. Sounds interesting. Hope you win another gold award from Pam. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, where, uh, Bang. Where do we, we, I, I'm waiting for some... Yeah, yeah. We, we have two questions, uh, architect <laughs> from our students, Ryan Chum. Uh, how would you design small projects differently compared to larger projects and why? That's the first question. Okay, how do you design small projects differently? Okay, uh, bungalows, uh, like small resorts like that one, just 16 rooms and my small mosque is considered a small project. Uh, it is more personal, like I said. Uh, the requirement is very specific, especially for bungalows. But almost every bungalow owner will want their house to be different than any other building that I have designed. So I will be asking them a lot of questions. I will. The easiest question is to ask them what they like. 
I mean, hobbies and things like that. So that will actually directly connect the house to them. I mean, there were clients who didn't know that, you know, they like to collect paintings. They just like art, but they don't collect it. So when I know that he likes art, I say, why don't we have a gallery in your house? So that you can, you know, showcase your collection. He doesn't collect art yet at that time, but because of the gallery that I created, and suddenly he becomes an art enthusiast. He started to collect, you know, expensive drawings from famous artists. So that is small project. You you tend to be close to your client. Uh, you get to really understand, uh, you know, their needs. Some say architects can solve problems that the client do not know they have it. You know, things like that. That's that's the role of an architect. We are trained to solve problems. We are trained to think outside the box. Um, and I do the same thing if as much as possible. I try to do the same thing on bigger projects as well. You know, big I mean in terms of value, like for shop office, it is simple. What is a shop office? It's a shop. Uh, maximum opening on ground floor. And then top floor, you only have the front part and the rear part that's open to the outside. The rest is you know, internal space. Then you have toilets at the back. But then again, I mean, is that all you can do? You can't work on the building per se. You can work on the outside space. You can create green space. You can create gathering area. You create a dedicated grab pickup spot. You create signages that will be seen uh, from all angles and things like that. So all these are the value that you can add to your project, whether it's big and small. You need to somewhat work harder so that you can propose something new, something fresh to your solution. Okay. So you can do things, small projects are in the future of that thing. Like I said, whatever you apply for the small project, try to bring it for future uh, bigger projects. Uh, sad to say that some of this research that you do during school time suddenly stop when you go in the real practice. For some reason, deadline are uh, tighter. Uh, your boss will be breathing on your neck, asking for you to complete things ahead of time and whatsoever. So you lose that opportunity to research. You use the opportunity to study in depth of the problems that they put in front of you. So I would recommend that you continue this research and this uh, attitude in looking for something bigger or something more exciting. Uh, it's not the project that is exciting, but it's you, the designer, that make the project exciting. Okay. I hope that's something to Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, Jess, do you have any any question? <laughs> I see you're thinking very deep thinking. <laughs> Yeah, Ryan says thank you, uh, Architect Resin. Ryan. Okay, Jess, do you have any question? Sustainability. <laughs> you know, this thing, the keyword that I put here, what's the problem? <laughs> so when, when my kids were fighting each other, uh, when they were small. Hey, what's your problem? <laughs> my daughter will yell at, at her younger sister and all that. And I told my wife, yeah, they are going to be good architects. But none of them are taking architecture now. <laughs> so asking problem is a good thing. Okay? Be sure you have that as, as your standard uh, process in getting your answers. I think probably I have a question, Architect Rasin, while the rest are still thinking. 
Uh, you're also an educator. Uh, uh, I mean, for 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 a lot of years, right? So probably, what advice can you give to uh, to students specifically on lending design studio projects? And probably can share your experiences handling uh, your own students. Okay, one thing I realized uh, with all this advanced uh, technology and access to information, somehow students tend to make the solution so realistic. Uh, you are not in the practicing world yet. So I would recommend that you go crazy. You go, you know, because you have no constraints. Uh, you have time and cost is not your constraint. You, this is the time for you to be creative. But somehow or other, there are some schools that uh, focuses on technical issues. They ask about, uh, you know, travel distance ask about the detail of flat roof, your new flat roof, how are you getting the water to flow? Those things can be learned uh, later. Uh, architecture school are created to promote creativity. Uh, but I, I do understand that some employers expect you to know everything the moment you graduate. But what you learn in school should be, you know, just enough for you to le learn the real thing outside. Uh, I noticed some students are too detailed in, in construction. I've got email from year one student asking me about pool detail because they came to my house, they saw a swimming pool in my house, and they asked about filtration system of the pool. I said, you are year one. Go play with your color wheels. Go sketch. I mean, it's it's too technical, and we're afraid that if we were to ask you to do that now, it may limit your creativity. So it doesn't matter that you do buildings with three columns instead of four, or your beam span is forty meters, or whatever. At this stage now, because this is the part where where you try it out. And of course, there'll be some control for year three for a degree. There'll be tighter control for master students. But for first year, second year, I would say go crazy. The sky's the limit. You know? And have fun. You must have fun. You must enjoy what you do. Okay. <clears throat> That's true. Yeah. Even the sketching now is a dying art. <laughs> yeah. Everyone sits on the laptop and start working on their 3D modeling. Yeah, everyone Maybe go sketch up. Yeah. Everyone is working on Lumion and doing realism. <laughs> oh my goodness. No, no, that's that's not the objective for year one to year three, I think. I mean, it's nice, it's quite uh, impressive, but solving the problem is, is more critical than producing uh, pretty, pretty pictures. Where's Manny? I've not heard from him yet. Yeah, Manny is uh, having difficulty with, with the audio, but he, uh, he wants to... Sorry. I'm... Yeah, yeah. Working now. <laughs> I couldn't speak on my phone. Ah, okay. Change your so I'm borrowing, I'm borrowing a letter <laughs> from one of the students here. <laughs> Sorry, my brother. Hey, it seems like Nissan has stood you up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I took... <laughs> you need to punish that guy. Yeah. <laughs> Boil him alive. Okay. Maybe <laughs> questions from your students. Um, they're all dumbfounded, but what you said just now. <laughs> <laughs> I myself was inspired. I couldn't ask a question. Oh, come on. Get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Manny, probably Jesse has a question. Since, hey, uh, Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse. 
Ask me any question. Any question you want to? Okay, okay, one question. Why do you call it small project? Why do I call it small project? Yeah, it's not small. Well, uh, uh, See, you cannot answer. <laughs> to companies like RSP or Hijaz Kasturi or GDP, this kind of small project. Okay. Yeah. But uh, maybe that's what I'm good at. I'm more uh, detailed for small project. But I do have some big projects as well. But today I just share with you the small ones. <laughs> okay, I believe you. <laughs> Jesse has a question. Uh, Architect Rasin wants to hear it from the students. <laughs> okay. okay, Jesse? <laughs> Or anyone from the studio? <laughs> so, Mr. Manny asks, what turns you off? <laughs> what turns you off? What turns me off? Uh, Seeing my face. <laughs> <laughs> That's one. That's one. That's one. <laughs> uh, I would say I get turned off when I see the same thing over and over again. Uh, I get turned off when money is spent on something that is useless. Oh yeah, that really, really turns me off. Okay, I'm gonna say specifically some landscape decoration i call it decoration because it has no other purpose other than decorating uh, an open space landscape decoration they can only be seen from a helicopter that you might see in the on the interchange highway interchange when you have that cloverleaf turn you have that circular open space in the center you see some edges being put up, you see them trimming, but that's all you see from your eye level, from the driver level, because you're driving, what, 50 kilometers per hour, you see some escaping, okay, that's nice. But the actual design can only be seen from the top. It could be the shape of an emblem, it could be the shape of a logo, and uh, the, the famous one, probably the shape of a crescent and a star of our flag or whatever, that you cannot appreciate at ground level, the actual viewer's level. I got angry actually, not just turn me off, because that's a lot of money spent on something that I would say is useless, sorry. So if anyone is able to design something like that, please make sure that it is appreciated by the, by the intended user, whether it's human level. Of course, if in the future, everybody will be using drones as means of travel, of course. I mean, you can say the authority is thinking ahead of our time, you know, providing good uh, aesthetic view for future traffic. Maybe. Okay. And buildings too. It happened in buildings too. We see 3.6 meter wide corridors. There's air condition at 18 degrees. Mm -hmm. And no one is using the corridor. Or you see a big meeting room with a big skylight. It's 37 or 35 degrees outside and inside they have to keep it at 18 degrees because all the people using that meeting room is wearing coat and tie. So I don't think that is right. Okay. And actually that frustrated me more than seeing many. <laughs> the seeing many. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. I any, any, <laughs> yes, architect. 
Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. We we have a few more questions uh, from our colleague. Probably we'll take one more. Or... Maybe I ask questions. Yeah, it can. <laughs> I only show what three projects here. Which is the one that you like, and why? The students, not the lecturers. <laughs> Anyone? Oh, which nice. is which the one that you don't like and why? Because I, I'm not claiming that I provide the right answer all the time. And good uh, critique is, is welcome, actually, because it can help me do a uh, better product next time around. Or at least ask me questions so that I know that you have been taught well by many. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse, Sorry, probably since your, your, your video is on, you probably can, you can answer architect Rassi's question. <laughs> Everyone is so quiet today. <laughs> yeah, because it's the afternoon. Mm. There's no, no meal, no coffee. <laughs> or you want the lectures to answer architect question? Go ahead. Yeah. Um... Any of my colleagues wants to answer the question? Architect uh, I'm Jess. Um, uh, Jess, yeah. Yeah, uh, since uh, everyone feel quiet. Uh, um, I, I, I like the uh, challenge, uh, probably, um, um, uh, I can imagine the, the challenge when you facing a committee, when you uh, trying to propose that most, um, you know, the most, uh, the is it dying, Ibrahim, is it? Okay. Um, um, I suppose, uh, you know, it's not so easy uh, to convince uh, the design route uh, or the design philosophy to divert from the very much entrenched uh, socio-cultural ideas about what most uh, design should be like. Yeah, uh, should be and and uh, I'm glad there's only one person who asked you that difficult question. You know, uh, before I had you know, the whole committee, you know, sort of uh, asking, you know, uh, very much the same question, you know? uh, very much the same. You know, they have a very uh, entrenched idea about uh, certain icon or certain symbols. Uh, certain values, um, and um, uh, for this project to take off, um, uh, also I noticed that uh, the construction is uh, very uh, economical. Am I right? I mean, um, it, it uses a very light uh, steel steel works, you know, for the columns. I suppose uh, the engineer is also on the same page. As you were as well, yeah. um, um, but uh, I wonder, um, can you tell me more about how does it feel to be inside the mosque? Uh, you mentioned about uh, thermal comfort. You mentioned about uh, solar glare. Uh, you have come with the uh, design of the fenestrations, uh, i.e., the uh, the shading devices. Um, how does it feel uh, in there? I mean, uh, it, it's very difficult um, just from a one snapshot uh, to imagine what it's like because uh, before the trees has finally grown up now, you know, what is it like? Yeah, 
Thank you, Jess. Uh, it's, uh, it's an all glass prayer hall, actually. Yes. Uh, the entire prayer hall is uh, enclosed in that glass box. And we decided that it will be air conditioned. So no questions about it. Air conditioner has to be turned on when you use the prayer hall. Because we have shading device outside, because we have the trees, uh, it has somewhat uh, lessened the heat load in that space. Uh, we have installed a centralized system, no, sorry, VRV system, a total of 30, what, 30 horsepower, 30 BT. I'm not sure the what the unit was, but it was, oh, Horsepower, 30 horsepower for, for the prayer hall, 10 on each side, except for the front side. So a uh, good thing to know that it's turned on 10 minutes before prayer time, then it is turned off 10 minutes after. Uh, so those who come in late, they can still feel the uh, whatever uh, cool air that is left in that space. And because uh, it is all enclosed and there is no fan inside, which is done uh, purposely, we manage to keep the cool air at the human level. Because if we were to mix it with a ceiling fan, then it will just throw the cool air upwards. Then it, it will disturb the the effectiveness of your air conditioning system. So far, I have not uh, received any complaints. Uh, we had used it at full capacity during Friday before there was uh, PKP, before there was MCO. They actually pushed in to more than the maximum uh, capacity. It was supposed to be just 350. They inserted 400 people in the prayer hall. It was still not too bad, still comfortable. And uh, if indeed there's uh, breakdowns, you will only be able to open up the sliding door at the door level. So there will still be some form of cross ventilation in that space. But it's not as comfortable of having the icon on. So uh, in a way, they say it is uh, it's cooler because it is small. If you compare this to probably a normal mod, the entire ground floor may be air conditioned because they keep saying about you know full capacity on Friday. Everybody wants aircon. I said you no. Know, you only provide uh, air conditioning space for your everyday use, five times a day, six days a week. Uh, on Friday, to bed, some of them who come in late have to pray outside or pray in the naturally ventilated area. Do, 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 uh, if no one else have any question, I just like to. <laughs> uh, uh, Prince, uh, are, you, are you okay? Yeah, yeah. yeah sure, sure. Okay, um, um, it's just that um, now it become very prevalent, even uh, in my kampong. Um, they demolished the old mosque, uh, which I thought was fine, and they they built it, um, you know, and with uh, um, also air conditioning units, um, uh, just similar to what you, your uh, mosque, uh, you know. Um, but the issue is um, the the bills, um, you know, to um, to pay, you know, for the Cost of this air conditioning um, is getting higher and higher, especially uh, if it's in a kampong where everybody, you know, we, where you don't get the donation as much, you know, other than the funds from the uh, the, uh, the what Islamic bodies. Um, so it is a struggle, and um, I noticed that um, there are a few more uh, kampong that um, when they rebuild the mosque in the same batch. Uh, they uh, using the same 
uh, approach, you know. Uh, do you think that uh, this could be an issue, you know, uh, if it's uh, in a locality where uh, some mosques get a lot of donation? I mean, in fact, my 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 place here, you know, they get something like twenty thousand uh, dollars ringgit, you know, you know, easily, you know, before the uh, uh, before the pandemic, you know, uh, a week easily because there's a big career, but in in Kampong like that, where the career is, is a lot, lot smaller and it seems to be a struggle. And I think that we should be looking more into a more passive usage of uh, conditioning uh, for thermal comfort in um, uh, places like that. Well, what do you think? I mean, uh, yeah, I, I totally agree with you actually. Uh, we started the surah like that without any air conditioner. We had all the walls uh, removed. So it was just an open shed, a big umbrella roof, very breezy uh, when you have breeze, but it could be quite hot and uncomfortable if there's no wind actually. So we install a uh, industrial fan and it's noisy. But the toughest part that we face, I mean, I went through this personally, I experienced this actually, is when it rains. Because if you want more air to flow through your space, you have to provide maximum openings. But with big openings, you get rain splashes as well. So when it rains, like my, my roof for the surau is 15 feet high. I mean, half the, the prayer hall gets wet. So it was, it was really tough to balance that. Look at this. It was good and breezy when the weather is good, but when it rains, you can't use it. So I propose to install sliding glass door uh, for the perimeter of the race platform. But uh, it was good that the committee was against it. So in the end, we went for uh, roll up blinds with uh, bamboo blinds with plastic sheets behind it. So that in a way prevent, uh, it will still be wet, but it's not totally wet if you don't have it. So, like it or not, uh, we have come to a time where our comfort level or demand for comfort has changed. Uh, maybe previously we can sit quietly and comfortably in 24 to 26 degrees, but nowadays we need 22 degrees in order to you know, pray or do our activities peacefully like in classroom or in office. So with that, I, I actually have agreed that Econ will be part of my design. But my job is to make sure that you air condition, you put air conditioning only for the required amount. You don't overdo it. Yeah. And I can imagine it could be quite problematic for compounds as well in order to raise. But I've done uh, most in kampongs as well. Uh, the hall was even smaller. They wanted a prayer room, uh, a mosque for 350 people. It's not that big, but I only uh, put air conditioning unit, split unit, just split unit, two, two numbers. For 100 people, only 30 feet by 30 feet. And guess how many come on daily basis? Probably less than 10. Seriously, because they will ask for a big one. We don't get this kind of building you know, every year. The moment you get it, you put it maximum. We want a place for 350 people. Okay, I say you will get 350 people. You will fit 350 people, but only once a year or twice a year. But for your everyday need, I give you 100 people. That's even more than what you have. True enough, I went there. There was only like 10 people. It is sad, but it's the truth. So I use this as my argument whenever 
the party uh, objected my idea of making the prayer hall small. So they tend to accept it and now it's actually making my job uh, a lot easier. Jess? Thank you. Um, okay, that's all. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank, thanks so much, Architect Rasi. Thanks, Jess, for the question. Okay, I think with that, uh, we'll be ending our session for today. Uh, on behalf of the School of Architecture, Building and Design, I would like to thank uh, Architect Razin okay, for taking a time off. I know you're very busy, but uh, it's very valuable. Okay, your presence is very valuable to our students and also likewise to my colleagues and myself. Okay, again, a uh, round of applause, virtual applause for our distinguished guest speaker, Architect uh, Razin. Okay. Uh, we hope to see you again. Probably we can invite you for the final review. Man, we can invite you again okay. uh, sometime in December, December uh, 3rd of December. Okay, so we look forward to having you and yeah. share more of your expertise and your, your knowledge okay, to us. Okay, so before we end, uh, I hope it's okay for us to, to take a group photo. Uh, yeah, a virtual group photo. Jesse, would you be kind enough to do the group photo? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, Turn on your camera, everybody. Do I stop sharing? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I'll give another 10 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 6. Okay, I'll take the good photo now. 1, 2, 3. Um, yeah, that's it. All right. Uh, Thank you, sir. Thank Bye, you. Razin. I'm behind Jesse. Thanks so much, Jesse. Uh, thanks, Architect Rasin, again. Thank you. I, I, hope, I hope you're happy to see Emmanuel today, also. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Manny, for inviting Architect Rasin. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Hey, uh, for our students, they uh, will have a 10 minutes break before we proceed for our, for our 1C briefing. Okay, so be, be back at 3.05. Okay. So let's have a quick uh, tea break or a toilet break. Okay, thanks everyone. Okay. What time will we be back again, uh, Prince? Uh, oh, sorry, 4.05, sorry. We'll be back at 4.05. Okay, thank you. Thank you.